Brooke, give us an insight into just how important aviation is to General Electric. Sure. I mean, this has really been the workhorse for GE for, you know, the past couple of years. Aviation has been very strong, posting great revenue numbers, strong operating margins, and it's going to become even more important to GE as it moves forward with its plans to spin out that healthcare division. So then you're really going to be left with sort of a two-legged stool of aviation and power. They will also have renewable energy, but that's a smaller business for them. So the real question is, can aviation keep up that momentum? And can they continue to keep it competitive? as they're dealing with all of these issues in power. So, so Richard, until yesterday, there was some speculation they might actually try to sell off the aviation unit. Now we have Mr. Culp saying, no, we're going to sell it. Uh, was that a wise decision? Yeah, I think so. You know, it represented a potential source of cash, obviously, selling the GCAS, uh, you know, unit. But it really would have jeopardized the uh, market standing of their commercial uh, jet engine uh, unit. You know, you had this wonderful synergistic relationship between the people who finance jet purchases and the people who build new jet engines. So uh, even though it was certainly a, a way out, a partial way out of their financial issues, and I think it would have long, in the long term damaged their competitive interests in the uh, commercial aerospace market. Richard, was it possible to sell GCAS? I mean, as you just look at the size of that and some of the buyers that were speculated on the private equity side, there had been, you know, talk whether or not those private equity firms could come up with a big enough equity check to actually do this deal. Yeah, it's a perfectly legitimate question. I mean, this is a very big player in the aviation business, tied with AirCap for uh, top two. Uh, there was talk that maybe they could break it up, though, and sell parcels of aircraft. You know, the market for jetliners is still really strong, but uh, I think we might have moved a little bit past uh, the great days of purchasing jet portfolios, that is to say, leasing assets. There were some crazy and great moments back a few years ago. Uh, it might have been possible then to purchase the whole thing, somebody, Chinese cap capital, somebody. Uh, but now I think it probably would have required a breakup and that might have diminished the total asset value. As you look at aviation down the road, you know, there's been a ton of speculation, especially this week, about Boeing's middle market aircraft and whether or not that's actually going to materialize. Do you see GE as being competitive to be an engine provider on that plane, given some of the challenges it has elsewhere in its business? Yeah, you know, it's funny. There are only three engine primes in the world, of course, Rolls-Royce and uh, UTC's Pratt & Whitney unit. Uh, each of them have very big problems right now. So even though GE has, of course, major issues, as you say, so does everybody. Um, it's sort of an interesting moment in time looking at 797 NMA, assuming it goes ahead, you can really see the impact of GCAS because when a company like GE goes to talk with Boeing about providing a power plant for a new engine, one of the key arrows in their quiver is to say, hey, look, not only do we build a really great engine, but on top of that, we have this leasing unit that will guarantee you an upfront order for, say, 50 or 100 of these, thereby bolstering its uh, business case. So having GCAS as part of GE Aviation, you can really see how this enhances the unit's competitiveness. So, so Richard, it's a good business. They're going to hold on to it. It's going to help them stop the bleeding. But Mr. Culp has to start growing the business as well. Can they grow this substantially and how? Where are their opportunities in terms of growth? Yeah, you know, I mean, this is a big issue. Obviously, 797 NMA plays a role in that. Another is, frankly, the ramp on the single aisle uh, narrow body families. Uh, they have about uh, a 50% position on the A320 NEO series. They have a 100% position on Boeing 737 MAX in conjunction with their partners, uh, Safran, through the CFM consortium. Uh, those programs are still ramping up very nicely. Uh, there's talk of going beyond rate 60, that is to say 60 jets per month, or obviously 120 engines per month, to perhaps up to 70, and maybe even beyond. So obviously uh, anything that makes the commercial jetliner market look good makes their growth prospects look good. One problem, though, is they also have an exclusive position on Boeing's 777, both the current generation and the next generation, and that's been hit by headwinds in the uh, the twin-aisle long-haul right. wide-body market. 